there's any way out, there's any way up, they don't see any hope. So I come before you this morning to say, what if I told you that no matter how damaged you are, and no matter how you got damaged, you are not beyond repair. Now, people try to repair their lives with all sorts of things. Some turn to self-help, and they buy certain books and go through certain seminars and follow certain uh, uh, speakers that do s- these things, and they, and they try to find self-help. Now, nowadays, you can just, of course, Google it, and you just go to the Internet, and people are YouTube videos, and you try to do things to sort of better your life. Some turn to education. They feel like, because the world says that, listen, everybody needs an education. you got to go get educated. Some will pour so much time and money and even go deep into debt to get an education, hoping that that repairs their life. Some turn to family. We value family. We believe we, you know, we all, all of us who have family and are able to, uh, to enjoy the, the environment of being around family, you know how much of a blessing it is. But some people turn to their family feeling like that is what's going to be the answer to their broken lives. And then, of course, many turn to religion. And there's all sorts of religions in the world. Religion is simply, to, 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 to boil it down to what it really is in its essence, it is a man-made attempt to repair your life and work your way to some sort of salvation. That's what religion is. It's a man-made attempt to work your way to some sort of salvation or heaven or to earn your way to God. That's why I always say Christianity is really not a religion because religion is a man-made attempt to get to God. Christianity is very straightforward. It says you cannot work your way to God. You cannot repair your own life. You cannot earn salvation. It is given to us by the gift and the grace of God. Christianity is altogether different. I'm bringing you hope today because whatever you've tried in the past, and it's failed, and I know it's failed because we've all tried that stuff, I'm telling you today there's hope. And the hope is in Christianity, the Christ of Christianity, and His name is Jesus, and He's real, and He's God, and He knows you, and He loves you, and He can repair your life. Can I get an amen this morning? So to illustrate this, I want to bring to you a story from Acts chapter 8. It's one of the most powerful stories you'll ever read because there's so many things about this story. I I promise you I don't have time to cover all the details because if you want to just uh, do some Bible studies just on this story, you could study it for a month and still be discovering new aspects to it. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 26. For those of you who are here with us in the room, I'm going to put this up on the screen for you to follow along. Acts 8, 26, it says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. I love that. It just The Holy Spirit speaks to Philip, says, Get up and go. Do you know the Holy Spirit's always speaking to us? He's always speaking to us, and He's pushing us, and He's telling us to go and do things, because if you're a believer, you're on this earth to be the mouth and the feet and the hands of Jesus Christ right now, and the Holy Spirit is pushing you and leading you. I hope you're listening. Verse 27 says, so Philip got up and went. That is the good definition of being a Christian. God says go, so you get up and you go. Amen? That's what it means to follow Jesus. So he got up and went, and here's the story. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. And he had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. Now let's stop right there. So in Acts 8, Philip Philip sees someone that you got to realize this is a very unique moment because Philip is Jewish and he's a first century Jew. And this guy that he's about to meet is someone that normally a Jewish man wouldn't talk to. And there's various cultural reasons, one of them having to be uh, where he was from, what type of person he was. 
as far as his job, as far as he was a eunuch. We're going to talk about some of that, but this is very unique. Normally, these two people would never talk. There's also some class issues in that day and time. Now, I know many of us Americans, we don't, this, this kind of stuff's hard to really comprehend because we live in the land of the free, man. We'll talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime, whether they want to talk to us or not, right? But there are cultures and there are places and there are times where it just wasn't allowed. It, just, what, it was just something you did not do. And I'm telling you, this man, Philip, talking to this Ethiopian eunuch who was a high official, literally works for the queen, these two should never talk. I mean, just for Philip to approach this man might even cost Philip his life. On the top of all that, like uh, we've mentioned here in the Bible, and I think there's a very important point, that's why the Holy Spirit put it in the story, the man is a eunuch. He's a eunuch. What, what is a, a, a eunuch? A eunuch is, of course, a man who has been castrated so that he can work in the women's living areas. I never thought I would have to use that word in the pulpit, but I did. Uh, this man has gone through this medical procedure so that he could work as a trusted guard in the women's living area. So they did this to him so that they felt like because of that they could trust him, you see. And so he's a eunuch. He's a eunuch so that he could have his job. I don't know if he asked to have this job. I don't know if this was something that he was going for. I, I, I don't know if it was something that he chose or if they just picked him or what. It might have been his career choice, but he has to be a very brilliant man. In fact, he's in charge of the entire treasury of the queen. So he's a brilliant man. This might be his career choice, but it came with great sacrifice to uh, be sexually altered like this, to become the CFO of the Queen of Ethiopia. You know, some people may find that very strange that he would, be, that he would sacrifice certain things like this to be in this position, but uh, it's just something to think about. Again, there's some deep thoughts in this text. Here's a man who had to say goodbye to family, to ever having his own family. He, he gave it up. He had to give up having descendants, having his own legacy. He gave it all up. Total sacrifice for his career and his job. Now, by the way, before you judge him or think crazy about him, that stuff still goes on today. Maybe not the medical procedure necessarily, but there's a lot of things people give up for career. A lot of things they sacrifice for a job, for more money. They'll give up family. They'll give up all sorts of things for more money and prestige and position and to work their way up in the corporate world. So I want you to get your mind wrapped around this, that it's very relevant. Don't, you know, some of these things are a little strange to us culturally, but if you think about it, there's some things that we can identify with. These are just re real people, normal people. They got, one's got a really good job, one's just an average guy that's out here trying to serve the Lord. They come from very different cultures, di very different backgrounds, different ethnicities, and all of that. And here's the thing about this eunuch. Again, has gone through all of this and sacrificed all of this, and now, let's just put it this way, he's damaged. The choices and the life that he's living has damaged him. On the inside, there's been something cut away from his soul, and it hurts, and he's seeking help. He's lonely. He's unsatisfied. How do we know this? Because he went all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem looking for answers. He went all the way to the temple in Jerusalem. There were synagogues in Ethiopia. There were synagogues all along the path from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. He could have went to church anywhere. But he went all the way to the big temple because this man could not find the answer he was looking for. So he went as far as he could go to the place that he felt like, surely I can find the answers to my soul here. And so he went to the temple. He's spiritually hungry. 
He's lonely. He's damaged. And he's hoping to find answers. But here's what we know. We know that when he got to the temple, he was turned away. He was turned away. We know that for several reasons. First of all, he's headed back to Ethiopia right now, and obviously his, his, ans- his questions aren't answered. Obviously, he's still seeking. He's, he's still searching. He's reading the Bible. He's like, I still don't know. I went all the way to the temple, and I couldn't get any help. And we also know from the Old Testament that there was a particular law in the Old Testament that forbid eunuchs from going into the presence of God. The the eunuchs could not enter into the temple if you were a eunuch. Now, that, that that is a strange law. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes you read things in the Old Testament and, and you read it and you believe it and you trust it because it's God's word and it's God's law. And you just say to yourself, I don't know, I don't know why he made that law, but I'm sure he had a good reason, right? And so this is kind of one of those laws that nobody that was sexually mutilated could enter the temple. They would be rejected by the temple. And I've thought about this long and hard this week, and I thought to myself, now, if you're, if you're all my theologians, just give me a little grace here, because I was just thinking about this. I thought to myself, as strange as that law is in the Old Testament, I wonder, I just wonder if God made that rule for this guy, this one guy, so this one story could be in the Bible. I don't know. Because here we are, and this one guy gets this story in Acts 8 where he's this very important man, but he's a eunuch. He goes all the way to the temple. He gets rejected. And maybe that law was put into the Bible so that this man, with all of his resources, he's wealthy, he's powerful, he's prestigious, he's the CFO of a queen of a country, and yet he too is so damaged He's separated from God. Maybe God put that law in there to force this context, to say, listen, everybody, no matter who you are or where you're from or what you've got, everybody is damaged. Everybody needs salvation. Nobody can fix themselves, you see. Now, I don't know, maybe that's in here just so that his hopes are dashed so that all of us can read this and we can relate to it and we can identify because we know what it's like to have our hopes dashed, to be separated from God. And that's where we find the story. Let me pick it up in, 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 the, in the next verse. In verse 28, it says, The Spirit told Philip, Go and join the chariot. And, and when Philip ran up to the chariot, He heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. So he's listening to him read, and he walks up to, I love this. Philip doesn't just start preaching to him. Philip just doesn't say, hey, let me give you all the answers. Philip, ask a question. He's basically asking for permission to be invited into the conversation. This is very smart and wise on Philip's part. He simply says, as he's listening to this man read the Bible, he says, "Uh, excuse me, do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, he says, how can I, the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? And I just picture Philip going, can I get up in that chariot and talk to you? Verse 32, verse 31 says, So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the scripture passage he was reading was this, and then it gives you the scripture passage. So, this eunuch was reading this scripture passage in the book of Isaiah, which in that day and time, you got to realize the New Testament's not written yet. So, he's reading the only Bible that's available, the Old Testament, and he's trying to understand it. And he's reading from the book of Isaiah, and it's touched his heart. It, it's, it's, it's something that he identifies with. It, it's, this particular passage is, has captured his soul and has drawn him in. Verse 34 says, And the eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? So if you look at the text, it's talking about, you know, uh, this person in Isaiah 
is, is broken, this person is victimized, this person is damaged. And he's like, who, who's saying, who is this about? Is it this guy Isaiah or is he talking about someone else? In verse 35, Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus beginning with that scripture. So Philip just simply says, sir, let me explain it to you. This is about Jesus. Now, to really feel what this man was feeling, I want us to turn to Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, and I want us to read the text from the book of Isaiah that this guy would have been reading. So I've got it here on the screen for you. Isaiah 53, it says, verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. Now watch this. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised. And we didn't value him. Now think about the eunuch reading that. You can see why it's drawing him in. He identifies with this person. Who is this? People turn away from him. People don't value him. And then it says, verse 4, he says, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and carried our pains, but we in turn regarded, regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punished for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of the oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off. I'm sure the eunuch focused on that. He was cut off from the land of the living. He knew what it was like to be broken and damaged. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He's reading this text, and I don't believe it's the first time he's read it. I believe it might have even drawn him to Jerusalem. He's been reading this text, and he's gone all the way down, and he couldn't get answers. He's coming back. He says to Philip, what does this mean? What does it mean? What does it mean, this person who says they, they were cut off and turned away? Philip looks at him and says, I'm telling you, sir, this is Jesus Christ. This is Jesus Christ, the God who created you, the God who loves you, the God of everything. He came to this earth and was born, and he lived as a broken man. He went to the cross and was broken for the broken. He became a eunuch, like a eunuch for the eunuchs, like a leper for the lepers. He became unclean so that you and I can be clean. He became cast out so that you and I can be brought in. He paid our penalties of our sin so he could stand in our place. He became sin for us so that he could give us his righteousness. The Bible says that Philip just began to preach the gospel to him all through the scriptures. I'm here today to tell you that there is hope no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've gone through. You cannot find it in yourself or in riches or in accolades or in successes. It's found only in Jesus Christ. In fact, I, I saw this little... Um, uh, video that I want to play for you. And <clears throat> this young lady named Letitia Wright, she is uh, someone, some of y'all may recognize her. She's been in a lot of stuff, including some very popular movies. And I'm just going to play a, play a little brief video of what she, she had to say. Watch this. If guys, if you're ready back there, watch this. I literally steal everything from you guys and post it on my Instagram. Fight me. I was 
pretty much going through life. I had all of these ambitions and all of these things that I really wanted to do. But I was also just dealing with like some dark stuff that I wasn't like unboxing it and like trying to solve it. I just knew something was wrong. I was not fulfilled by life. Even if I booked an acting job, it was like, what's the next acting job? If I had money in my pocket, it was like, how much more money can I have? What else can I get from this? It's like nothing literally satisfied. And I just knew some people was up. I just knew that this can't be life. But thankfully, um, my friend, yeah, my friend um, called me one day and he was just talking to me. He's just like, God told me to call you and tell you that you're not in a good place. I can tell you about Jesus. And his spirit set me free, so I'm just sharing it with you. And in that sentence was like, the interest just clicked. And he gave me uh, Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added on. The first time I read it, I just see seek first the kingdom. As I started to read the different verses and the different versions, it just basically said, keep your eyes on God. In, in its entirety, that's what it meant. I, was just, I just got really hungry and I really just kept feeding myself on the word and the gospels were just my favorite. Like literally all of those, you know, amazing red letters are just, you know, so impactful and just brought life to me. I'm able to, you know, have an app that gives me scriptures and, and gives me breakdown. Then you see a, a verse and it literally brings your mind back into alignment to what God wants you to be and, and who God wants you to be. I knew something happened, but I knew there was something different in my spirit. I felt free and my mind wasn't tripping anymore. It was like, I'm actually free. I wanna go back to this text because I've been following this Letitia young lady. She's, her testimony is powerful. She actually took some time off from acting to follow and pursue Jesus Christ. Her life was falling apart with all of her successes. Some of her movies are some of the top movies that have been out in the last couple of years. I'm telling you, as I listen to this young lady, I saw in her what I see in so many people. Someone who's broken. Someone who's, and you, when you look around their life, you say to yourself, how can they be broken? How can they not have it all together? But inside, everything was falling apart. And this eunuch was like that. And he's reading in the Bible, and he's reading about Jesus Christ, who was cut off from the land of the living. He just, in other words, everybody, you know, cut off from the land. You could read into that and, and feel it so many different ways. Obviously, we recognize that Jesus was crucified on the cross and died, literally cut off from the living. But I'm telling you, you could be living and be cut off from the living. Amen? Jesus came to this earth, and he identified with me and you. God said, I care about you. And to prove that, I will become one of you. And I will feel what you feel, and I will go through what you go through. And I will live in this broken world that you live in. Because I can fix it. And only I can fix it. And I'm going to come to this earth, and I'm going to do it in person. And Jesus Christ came and lived on this earth for, for, for all those years, for decades, lived a full human life, and then finally died on the cross and rose again and solved the problem. Rose again healed. Rose again glorified. Rose again as King of kings, Lord of lords, God of all. Amen? And it's people like this eunuch and Letitia who finally see that for what it really means. And the moment you see it, your life is dramatically and radically changed. When you learn to trust Jesus and follow Jesus, here's what happens. Now, listen very closely, because some of you in here, this hasn't happened to you yet. You're this close. You're this close, but it hasn't happened yet. 
You've been coming to church, you've been listening, you've been reading your Bible, you've been seeking, you've been asking the right questions, but you have yet to fully trust in Jesus Christ. You're trying to add Him to your life. Listen, you, just, you can't just add Christianity to a broken life. That's not how it works. When Jesus comes in, He takes over, Amen. He doesn't just take a seat in your heart next to everything else that's there. No, he takes over, he cleans house, right? And Jesus Christ, when he comes, you know, here it is. When he comes and when you trust him and you give him your life, your broken, damaged, sinful, ungodly, filled with guilt, filled with shame, filled with all the junk just like the rest of us have, when you give it to him, Every bit of it, everything you've ever done, ever will do, all of your sin, all of your guilt, all of your shame, all of your brokenness, he takes it all and he puts it under the blood that he shed on the cross and it's paid for and it's washed away and it's separated as far from you as the east is from the west which never ends. It just keeps getting further and further away. It'll never be held against you. It's gone in the eyes of God. But he does more than that. He not only takes your sin, he not only takes your life and pays for it. Here's the part many people miss. He then, at that moment, he gives you his life, his perfect life. He lived a perfect human life. He fulfilled all the demands of God. He kept all the commandments. He he kept all the rules. He never sinned. He lived the life that you and I should live but haven't, and he lived the life that you and I can't live because we're sinners, and he lived that life so that he could give you credit for it. So that you can have credit for it. So that he will give you his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So that when God looks at you, he no longer sees the sin and the brokenness, he sees righteousness. He no longer judges you. He no, you're no longer under condemnation. God gives you the life of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus. It's credited to your account. Now, you're still sinful, you're still broken, you're still messed up, but there's something radically awesome and different that's already been given to you. It's been deposited into your soul. And with that, your whole identity changes. Everything about you becomes brand new. Your identity changes. You see, now God no longer sees you just as you and the old you. He sees you as the new you, the you in Christ. Your identity is now in Christ. Now, we live in a generation where we, we all try to create a lot of new identities, you know. We live in a generation now that it's kind of easy to change identities. You can go online and you can uh, start building a new identity and, and uh, change a lot of things. You can... Uh, change the trajectory of your life through performance and achievement. You can get a good job, go to school, and all this kind of stuff is going on out in the world, and now everybody's kind of like comparing themselves to each other. And all this critical race theory where we're talking about different ethnicities and who's oppressed and who's oppressor and who's got privilege and who doesn't. This is the big thing out there, and it's a bunch of garbage because all of those identities are broken. They're all damaged. I don't care where you're from or who you are or what what your background is. We are sinners, every single one of us. And all we try to do in this life is try to improve ourselves and create a new identity, which really in a way is, is just in a human attempt to feel superior to someone else. To just feel better about you. At least I'm not like that person. Whoever that person might be. Right? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Now, and I mean this. This is the core of what I'm saying this morning. All identities not based on the cross demonize others who have a different identity. All identities not based on the cross demonize, demean, diminish, disparage others. 
I don't care if you're woke. I don't care if you're BLM or Marxist or Antifa or the identities coming out of Hollywood or the porn industry or the social media industry. This is the kind of junk being fed to people so that they can try to fix themselves. And it's not working. In fact, what we're seeing in our generation is the height of it not working to where now we're killing each other in the streets. Trying to prove who's better than the other. I'm here today to say there's another way to build true identity, the only right way, and that is the way that is based on the grace of God where my meaning and my hope is not based on me, which removes any need for me to feel superior to anybody else, because who I am is not based on me. Who I am is based on the grace of God. Who I am today is not something I achieved. It's not something I earned. It's not something I deserve. Who I am today, I am in Christ Jesus, and I got it by His grace. Amen? He gave me something I did not deserve. I didn't earn it. I didn't work for it. He gave it to me. He came to this earth, and he loved me while I was yet a sinner. And When I gave my life to Jesus, he gave his life to me. My identity is in Christ. Amen? My identity is in Christ. I think this is... <laughs> I just picture Philip reading the book of Isaiah, and he probably can't stop reading it now. Like, once Philip got the Bible in his hand and started reading it to this eunuch, he just, the whole gospel's coming out. So I kept reading in Isaiah. Look at Isaiah 56. And I apologize for a while ago, I didn't flip the page for you. I'm going to keep up this time. This is what he says. He says, in Isaiah 56.3, it says, No foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord should say, The Lord will exclude me from his people. And the eunuch should not say, look, I'm a dried up tree. In other words, nobody should say, I can't bear fruit. Nobody should say, I I can't have a legacy. I'm a dried up tree. I'm a nobody. I'm worthless. I, I have no value. Nobody. If you come to the Lord, you'll never say that. Verse 4 says, for the Lord says this, quote, for the eunuch, Shall, did I not even turn it? I didn't turn it for you. I'm sorry about that. Here we go. For the eunuch, who keeps my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold firmly to my covenant, I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters, and I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. I still think I got it wrong for you up there. There it is. Sorry. I will give, I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. <laughs> I will give you a house and walls and a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. What does that mean, Pastor Rot? God says, you come to me, I am going to change everything about you and your legacy. You're trying to build something for yourself in this world, I will give you a house. I will give you a memorial. I will write your legacy. I will give you a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. There's that word again. Oh, that eunuch had to shout amen. Never, never. Never will this identity fail you. You will be who I want you to be, who I created you to be, who I made you to be. You will become who you're supposed to be if you give your life to me. 
everlasting, forgiven, a new identity. My true identity is in Christ. I'm telling you today, my friend, the Bible calls you who are Christians, he calls, the Bible calls you redeemed, calls you saints. My daughter asked me that the other day, said, does the Bible call us saints? What does that mean? We're saints? Yes, I'm a saint. I'm a saint. We were watching the saints, by the way, but anyway, different topic. We were singing, when the saints go marching in. The Bible calls you a saint. Randy, did you know you're a saint? You're a saint, brother. That's what God, that's the identity God's given you. I thought some say, I thought that was just for Catholics. No, that's for all the children of God. The Bible calls you a saint, calls you chosen. I thought I chose God. Hey, God chose you, man. God chose you. God knew you before you knew him. God was looking for you when you weren't looking for him. God found you. You didn't find him. He chose you. That's what the Bible says. You're the chosen. You're heirs. You're overcomers. You're kings, priests, beloved. You're the bride. You're the bride of Jesus Christ. That's how much he loves you. And God is faithful to his bride. Amen? Amen. I'm talking about your identity in Christ. I'm talking about God taking you and putting you back together the way he wanted you to be in the first place. Giving your life to Jesus will change you. You will look at yourself differently, and others will look at you differently. And you'll become part of the family of God which totally makes sense in the story of why these two guys could be talking to each other. Because when God gets involved, all the junk that breaks us apart and divides us goes away. And here's a Jewish man named Philip up in a chariot with his arm wrapped around an Ethiopian eunuch, and they are having church. Amen? And that's what God wants for you. You don't have to believe, believe the lies that you say about yourself anymore. You don't have to believe the lies others say about you. And I'm telling you, you don't have to believe the lies the devil says about you anymore. God will give you a new identity. That's what he wants for you today. And you can leave here a brand new person if you will trust in Jesus. I want to end with the end of this text. From Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. This is how the story ends. And it can end this way for you right now. Some, there's probably someone in this room right now. It can end this way. It says, as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? Verse 38. It says, so he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. <laughs> and when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went his way rejoicing. It's interesting. In, in the King James Version, there's a verse 37. Do you notice up there at 36 and then it goes to 38? Probably in your Bible. I don't know which translation you're using, but 37's not in every ancient text. So it didn't get into some of the translations, but it got into the King James Version. I love it. If you got it, you ought to read it. The eunuch said, what's going to stop me from getting in here? And Philip basically said, if you trust in Jesus, nothing is stopping you. And the eunuch says, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and Savior. And he said, and then let's get down in this water, and he baptized him. Now, baptism, baptism is something that new Christians do because Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples, and baptize. When they become disciples, not when they're little babies, when they're not making any choice about, but when a person chooses to give their life to Jesus and trust in Jesus, they ought to begin to follow and obey the Lord. So the first thing this eunuch said was, I want to obey and get baptized. 
I want to get baptized right now. So that means Philip's preaching to this dude. And they go down in the water. Now, what does baptism signify? It, it, you go under the water, which means your old life is dead. You're buried. We put you under water. And, you're, and it signifies that your sins are washed away. And then we bring you back up out of the water. And that's exactly what this eunuch did. Notice they went down into the water and then they came back. This wasn't a sprinkling, right? He didn't grab some water and splash it on him. They went down into the water and got down in it and got that man under the water, signifying that his old broken life is buried and dead with Christ on the cross. And then he brought him back up. And he's now identified with the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who resurrected from the grave. He brought him up out of the water, and he's saying to this eunuch, now your life is identified with the resurrected Lord. You have a new life. You're a brand new person with a brand new identity. And, of course, this man went away rejoicing. Changed everything. I would love for you to go away rejoicing this morning. You maybe came in here broken. You're hurting. Life has hurt you. Maybe someone's hurt you. Whatever is hurting, whatever is broken, whatever is damaged, I'm telling you, friend, consider the fact Jesus is your only answer. And trust me, when you get him, you realize you don't need anything else. He'll take over. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Do you identify with this story today? It's in the Bible for you. God put the story in the Bible just to try to give you a, an example of what he's trying to do in your life. It's not that complicated. It's not as complicated as some of you have made it to be. It's not religion. We're not trying to get you to join a church or join anything. We're trying to get you to Jesus. He's real. He's real. The Holy Spirit is here. You hear him speaking to your heart right now. It's louder than my audible voice that's going through this microphone because you hear it in your soul. God is saying, I love you. But you've got to give up this stuff that you're hanging on to. It's killing you. You got to repent of it. You got to turn away from it. You got to give it all to Jesus. And let him give himself all to you. Maybe right now you could talk to the Lord. You can talk to him silently because he's God. He can hear you. He can hear your thoughts. God even hears the things in your heart that you can't put into words. The Bible talks about the deep groanings of the heart. Maybe right now in your heart, talk to the Lord and say, God, I hear you speaking to me. Please forgive me of my sins. And name, name your sins right now. Name the big things that come to your mind right now. He already knows they're there. The, the question is, will you confess it to him that you know it's sin? Give it up. Be honest with him. Music to God's ears is when people get honest with him. Tell him what you're struggling with. Ask him to put it under the blood, to forgive you, to cleanse you. He will. He went to the cross for you. He died for you. He's willing to forgive you if you'll give it up right now. Confess it for what it is. Ask him right now to help you to turn away from sin 
and to not follow sin or self or the world or the devil anymore, but to follow only Jesus Christ. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask him to take over everything. To where your identity from this point on is that you are in Christ. In Christ. That means when we look at you, we should see Christ because you're in him. When God looks at you, he's going to see Christ because you're in him. Ask the Lord to put you in Christ and put Christ in you. That's what salvation is all about. Pastor Mike, would you come here to the front, please, and stand? I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and we're going to be, uh, we're going to wrap up our service and conclude. But if you've given your life to the Lord today, or you're seeking the Lord, you're asking God these questions, you need help, you want to talk to some of the pastors, past, I wanted Pastor Mike to be right here, front and center. This brother can help you. He can talk to you. He's like a Philip in our church. He'll talk to you. He'll meet you right where you are. His wife is back here. She, she'll come help as well if you want to talk to a lady. I'm here. My wife's here. Don't leave this place broken. Leave this place rejoicing. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for all those that you're calling to yourself today to be saved. God, we pray that people will trust in Jesus and Christ alone for salvation. They'll give up all of this other junk and all the other religious efforts and all of the other human efforts and trust that salvation is in Christ alone. Help them, Lord. Help us all. May this church just continue to be a place where people can come and find a new identity, a new family, a new world right here that we may help people to walk with Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.